So we're sitting there and having our meal together. And this individual says to me, yeah, it's bad, really bad, and it's wrong. But the media is making it worse by calling it racism. I just wonder what that guy did to make that officer go off on him like that. I can't figure out what would set that police officer off like that. It's just bad that the media calls it racism. I sat for a moment in shock. And then I blurted out, but it is racism. I really didn't know what to say. We continued to talk and discuss it further after finishing our meal. I know it may be hard to believe, but this individual is very pure hearted, very gracious, very slow to judgment, and has been involved in a very grace filled ministry for decades. So this was not hate. Later, as I reflected on the conversation, it dawned on me that in this person's realm, their daily routine, routine as a white person in a small community with very little overt racism, this person has seen very little racism firsthand, very little. And so it's easy to not recognize it when it happens in other places and seen through a digital screen. I grew up in a very actively non-racist home. I never once heard a single derogatory remark or about, remark about people of color, much less an outright racial slur. And we were clearly instructed that such behavior was not acceptable. In fact, when I heard it at friends' houses, it would scare me, the thought of uttering such a word in the four walls of my home. So sure, I heard my friends say things, but my home was explicitly not racist. And so was I, I thought. You ought to consider hiring Suzanne for your student worker position, my colleague said. She works over in Common Grounds, which was the small food venue on our campus. They served espresso and other coffee drinks and items off the grill like burgers and fries and the like. When I fi finally got around to following my colleague's advice a few days later, I walked into Common Grounds and asked for the young lady at the register asked the young lady at the register if I could talk to Suzanne. The cash register girl was wearing a wrinkled blue employee shirt with some flour and stains on her where she'd been working on the grill. She seemed very timid and quiet. On top of that, she was not just black, but very black. At first I thought nothing of it and just asked to speak to Suzanne. I'm Suzanne, she said. I'm sorry, I said, I'm not sure if I heard her right. I'm Suzanne, she said. You wanted to speak to Suzanne? I paused for a moment trying to figure out what was going on in my mind and in my gut. You're Suzanne? My unacknowledged thoughts went. My colleague said you are a top-notch student employee, but you don't look much like a top-notch student employee to me, I thought. It was too late though, I couldn't be dishonest. I mean, it was a Christian college we were at, you know, and just couldn't ignore her now. I'd already asked to speak to Suzanne and that was her. Oh yes, I spoke out loud now. Sorry, well, you know, Mr. So-and-so right in student affairs. Well, I told her I was looking for a great student employee and she, su she suggested I come over and ask you if you'd like to apply to work in the student accountability office. So I came over to see if you'd be interested. Uh, sure, she said. Well, Suzanne came to work for me the next couple of years, and we talked often about racial issues, both admitting our own faults and stereotypes. She taught me lots, and we're still friends today. But in the first few weeks after we initially spoke, I just couldn't get our conversation out of my mind. What is it with this, I asked myself. Why do I keep thinking about that conversation? And then it dawned on me. Yes, there were other factors that dissuaded my enthusiasm to speak to Suzanne, like her messy uniform and her unenthusiastic presence. But there was another factor that I knew was there and I didn't want to speak it out loud. It was gnawing in my gut. It wasn't just that she was black, she was really black. <sighs> there I said it. I had been dissuaded from wanting to hire her and part of the reason was her skin color. That's racism. I'd acknowledged to myself 
and I was disgusted to even admit it silently. No, it wasn't overt, active racism, and I didn't give in to it, but it was there. It was, at the least, passive, covert stereotyping, which I almost allowed to influence me in a hiring decision, and that's a form of racism. In the Gospel of John, in what's known as the Samaritan woman story, we're told eight times the ethnicity of the woman Jesus interacted with. Eight times we're reminded of her ethnicity or the name of the town, which was known by its ethnicity. Samaritans, half-breeds in that day and age. This was the woman that Jesus invited to drink of his life-giving water. We know today that ancient story writers used repetition to make their points clear. Eight times in that story, John reminds us that this woman's ethnicity should have mattered to Jesus and how he treated her, but it didn't. It did to everybody else, but not Jesus. Racism was present in Jesus' world. He knew it, and he addressed it with intentional acts of love. It's not systemic racism. Three times I've heard that statement this week, one of which was from a friend of mine. All three instances were from whites, but it was the social media post from a friend of mine that really got me to thinking. I really respect this person greatly. No, really, I do. The post went on to say much more good things, all of which I think I agreed with. Again, this person is not really racist. Trust me, I know. In fact, I feel pretty certain that this person would put themselves in harm's way to protect a person of color. But what was said struck me, and it just wouldn't go away. Quote, to use a phrase like systemic racism, the Post read, implies that the entire system is racist. The Post went on to clarify that the label systemic racism is not true. I think I know what the Post was trying to say, but to say that systemic racism is an inaccurate label and one we should not be using, well, I have to disagree with that. I think racism is systemic in the US. Our working definition of systemic seems to originate mostly from the medical field. One definition reads, relating to a system especially as opposed to a particular part, like the disease is localized rather than systemic. So would we say that racism is only localized in the US? I'm afraid the cancer is widespread, the physician said. It's systemic. Really, doc? It's systemic? The nervous patient replied. It can't be. You said it's in my bloodstream, but it has it attacked my nervous system yet? No, the somber physician replied. And I can still eat. I have a good appetite. It's not in my digestive system, right? He replied, still in denial. No, the doctor replied, it's not. And it's not in your respiratory system yet. But in addition to your bloodstream, it has attacked your immune system and your renal system. If you don't begin the next phase of stronger treatment soon, it will attack these other areas, which will lead to kidney failure, other illnesses, and well, we've discussed that outcome. According to one study, 90% of our nation's wealth is controlled by whites in the US. For every $100 that whites make, blacks earn around $57. African-Americans, are two times as likely to be unemployed as whites. Here's one statistic that hits home for me and my colleagues. Black students are three times more likely than white students to be suspended for the same rule violations in school. 
Unfortunately, I know firsthand just how true that can be. Blacks are shown 18% fewer homes and 4% fewer rentals than whites. Racism in the U.S. housing system has a long documented sad history. Black drivers, 30% more likely to be pulled over than whites. And speaking of the body and healthcare, it's there too. One study indicates that 67% of doctors have, quote, unconscious racial biases when it comes to their black patients, end quote. When I was preparing for today's message and looked up the multiple definitions of systemic, I did in fact find some definitions that might not fit the scenario of racism in the US. One definition in particular read, quote, fundamental to a predominant social, economic, or political practice, end quote. Maybe racism isn't fundamental to certain systems in America. Okay, I, I get that. But by rearing its ugly head in multiple systems, does it relate to and affect all our communities in multiple ways, like our fictional patients' cancer? Yes. Is it fundamental to every part of our system in the US? Maybe not fundamental, but it shows up in many systems and is not localized. It's not like a broken arm or just a moderate skin disease affecting only one system. It's more like cancer, which lies below the surface for so long until the day it rears its ugly head. And then sometimes it's too late, too late for some at least. It's systemic and we are all responsible. It's a distraction from the gospel. This is an old, an old ongoing conversation. One of the first places it showed up in the US was when it was at the least strongly implied by a group of eight Alabama clergymen in their letter to Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. in April of 1963, while Dr. King was in the Birmingham jail for protesting racial justice peaceably in the streets. It's strongly implied in the silence today of white Christians who refuse to open their mouth and speak up and stand with people of color. Worst of all, it shows up in the overt argument of those who say that, quote, social justice is not a part of the story and message of Jesus, end quote. That's actually not an exact quote, but that is how I've summed up what I've read not a part of the story and message of Jesus, what Christians call the gospel. The word gospel comes from the Latin and really means good spiel or good news. In Luke 10, in the Good Samaritan story, Jesus tells a story to a self-righteous religious scribe to help him see who really was his neighbor. His neighbor was a Samaritan. A man is robbed beaten and left for dead on the roadside. First, a racially pure priest comes by, but refuses to stop and instead walks to the other side of the road to avoid him. Secondly, another person comes by, a Levite from one of the best families in Judaism. He too passes on the other side. But it was the Samaritan man who stopped. Again, a half-breed to the religious leaders of Jesus' day. This racially inferior person was the only one in the story who was willing to stop and help the wounded man on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho and pay for that man's lodging and recovery. When Jesus finished that story in Luke 10, he asked the scribe, which of these three do you think proved to be the neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? The scribe couldn't even bring himself to say the word, Samaritan, and instead replied, 
the one who showed mercy to me. I believe Jesus purposely put this character in his story. The Samaritan man, who was of a very undesirable racial background, to make his point clear. Your racial bias against the Samaritans, or today against people of color, is an offense toward God. And I, the Son of God, who will die for the sins of the entire world, am addressing it now. Countless places in the scriptures, Old and New Testaments, address or command us to address injustices directed toward the oppressed. Psalm, Proverb 31, Proverbs 31, 9 reads, Open your mouth, judge righteously, and defend the rights of the afflicted and needy. In the fifth chapter of the book of Amos, whom Dr. King was so fond of quoting, Amos prophesies on behalf of God and calls out the nation of Israel for, quote, trampling on the poor. One translation translates that, exacting high rent. That's in verse 11. In verse 15, he tells them to hate evil and love good and establish justice in the gates. You see, in ancient times, the gate was the place where legal cases were heard. Clearly, God is simply saying, fix your unjust judicial systems. Further on in Amos 5 and beginning in verse 21, God says very bluntly, I hate, I despise your feasts, and I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. In your religious meetings is what he's saying. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. And the peace offerings of your fatted anim fattened animals, I will not look on them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. Instead, and as Dr. King was so fond of quoting, let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And it's not just in the Old Testament. In addition to what Luke writes, Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 19 said, If you would be perfect, go, sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. In chapter 22, verse 39 of the same book, he says, The first and greatest commandment is to love God with all your heart, soul, and mind. But the second greatest commandment is like the first. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Fully one half of the gospel. The past couple of weeks, if you are a follower of Jesus and have listened to a couple of sermons or podcasts, you might have heard people talking about the vertical and the horizontal relationships. This comes from the book of Amos. Amos, in that last prophecy, when God says he's sick of their solemn assemblies, is saying that if your relationship but from man to man, from human to human, it's not right. Don't try to come worship me and claim that your vertical relationship to me is okay. This is no good if this is no good. Speaking out about racial injustice is not a distraction from the good news of Jesus. It's a direct result from following that good news. Thank you.